Hello everyone, welcome to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to talk about the mean square and the variance. The prerequisites for this material are calculus, in particular series and integrals, discrete and continuous random variables, parametric distributions, and the mean. The goal is to define three very important concepts in probability and statistics, which are mean square, variance, and the standard deviation. And we're also going to derive the variance of some popular parametric models. Let's begin with the mean square. Uh, but before that, let's think about how we measure the magnitude of numbers and vectors. For numbers, we think of the magnitude of a real number as just its absolute value, which can be written as, its, uh, as the square root of uh, its uh, square. For vectors, we often use the Euclidean length of the vector, which is its L2 norm, which is the sum of the squares of its entries, and then we take a, a square root. Well, when we're thinking about quantifying the magnitude of a random variable, and again, a random variable is a bit of a weird mathematical object because it's a function from a sample space to either a discrete set or to the reals. So it's a bit difficult, you know, when, when you first encounter this concept, thinking of the magnitude of such an object. But a reasonable way of quantifying the magnitude or the energy in the random variable is to say, how about we consider its square and then just the mean value, the expected value, the typical value in some sense of its square. That gives us some idea of how much, uh, mean, you know, how much energy there is in the random variable. That's the intuition behind the mean square. Um, we use the mean square often to quantify the difference between two random variables, the logic being that uh, you want to compare these two objects, and what you do is you quantify the energy of their difference. So if you have an estimate E that is trying to approximate a random variable A, the way you quantify the difference often between these two random variables um, is you compute their difference, and then you consider the mean square of their difference. Okay, this is a popular metric to uh, quantify error, estimation error in statistics. So now let's think of you know, the following thought exercise. Imagine you have a random variable A and you want to find the best constant estimate. Okay, A can fluctuate, it's a random quantity. You want to come up with the constant quantity that is closest to A in mean square sense. How, do we, how can we find it? Well, we write down the mean square error, we expand it, we use linearity of expectations. So notice that the only random thing here is A. So when we expand this into expected value of C squared minus 2AC plus A squared, we can apply linearity of expectation and the constants essentially come out and we only get expectations with respect to A and A squared. Okay, so this is where this comes from. And now we have a function that only depends on C and we want to minimize that function with respect to C. This will give us the constant C that is closest to the random variable A in, in this mean squared matrix, mean squared metric, not matrix, metric. Okay, so um, how do we minimize a function that only has one argument? Well, we look at its derivative. Uh, this is a quadratic function, so the derivative is very easy. It's the derivative with respect to c. That's very important to remember. So it's going to be 2c minus 2c times the mean. Sorry, it's 2c and then 2 times the mean. Right, that's what it is. So it's equal to this. Now we need to see whether the function is concave, convex, or what it is. And it turns out that it is convex because the second derivative is just equal to 2. Again, it's a quadratic. So the function actually looks like this. And the minimum here is where the derivative is equal to 0. That's exactly the place where uh, c is equal to the mean. And this is pretty cool because this tells us that if you take any random variable and you want to approximate it with a constant, the best constant that you can choose from the mean squared error point of view is the mean. And that's another interpretation of the mean um, of a random variable. Okay, so let's move on to the variance. 
Now, we, you know, in some sense, the mean of the random variable is its center. We have seen that that's not completely the case. If there are extreme values in the random variable, then it's arguable that the mean is actually the center. But in many cases, you can think of the mean as the center of the random variable in a way. Uh, the variance tells us the expected square distance of the random variable to its mean. So, you know, how close is it to its own mean? In order to uh, measure the distance, we use this uh, mean square metric, and that's the variance. Okay, the variance is the expected squared distance between the random variable and its mean. I feel that I moved my hand way too much for, for what I was saying. Um, Usually, we don't compute the variance like this, okay? Because we, I mean, you know, you have this quadratic function inside the expectation. Instead, what we do is the following. We apply linearity of expectation, we expand this, and we realize that once you expand this down here, you get uh, the mean square minus two times. And here, realize that this is a constant. So the constant can come out and we get expectation of A, and here we have plus expectation of A squared. Notice that I'm putting the square here. This is just to try to minimize confusion to where we have the square there. But this just means the, um, the square of the mean. Okay, so actually this is just equal to the square of the mean. Well, my handwriting. I wish I had listened to my teachers in middle school. Okay, so here we have the square of the mean minus two times the square of the mean plus the square of the mean is minus the square of the mean, right? So we get um, a very simple expression for the variance in terms of the mean square. The variance is equal to the mean square minus the square of the mean. And that's often when we're doing, you know, when we're computing stuff, that's often how we compute variances. But both, you know, both formulas are, are valid. The first one is arguably more intuitive in terms of what the variance actually means. The second one might be more convenient when, when you're computing stuff. Because the mean is the expected value of a square, it's not uh, in the same order of magnitude of the actual quantity that we're modeling. Okay, it's kind of in the, in the same order of magnitude as the square of the of the magnitude that we are of the quantity that we're modeling. Because of that, we often take a square root to get, you know, to bring it back to the units, if you want, of the original quantity. And that gives us the standard deviation. Standard deviation, typical deviation of the random variable from its mean is obtained by computing the variance and then taking the square root. In practice, when we have data, how do we compute the variance? How do we compute um, the standard deviation? where, well, the, the variance is just an expected value of something. So we take the sample mean of that something. In this case, the deviation between the data and the mean. We, of course, don't have the mean because we have data to start with. So um, we, we subtract the sample mean there. Okay, and then we divide. This is how we compute the sample variance. Uh, the sample standard deviation is obtained by taking a square root of the sample variance. Okay, so let's now compute the variance of some parametric distributions. As you will see, some of the computations get a little bit complicated. We're just going to describe them at a bit of a high level. I encourage you to go through them at least once. You know, the, the, the calculus details are, are not, not super important, so we're not going to obsess about them, but it's good to know how these things are computed. Okay, so in general, the strategy we're going to follow is always the same. We know the mean from a previous video, so we're going to compute the mean square and subtract the square of the mean from it. Okay, so what's the mean square of a Bernoulli random variable? The random variable can be zero or one. It's zero with probability one minus theta, one with probability theta. So um, the mean square is just going to be theta, right? Because this is going to be zero, this term. So now we have theta minus the mean squared. Always remember that we need to square the mean. Okay, we need to square the mean. So it's going to be theta times 1 minus theta. That's the variance of a Bernoulli random variable. What about a geometric random variable? This is more complicated. We already know that the mean is equal to 1 over theta. And now we need to compute the mean squared. So we have this series that has 
a square here and then uh, the PMF and the PMF has this form. Here we use a similar trick to the one we use when we derive the mean of the geometric distribution. Um, we already established that this is true. How did we do this? We took the geometric series and we differentiated on both sides so that we would have a K here. Okay, and here we're also multiplying by alpha on both sides. Now we actually need a K squared there. So what are we going to do? We're going to differentiate uh, with respect to alpha again on both sides here. This gives us this expression. And now we're going to set alpha equal to one minus theta. And when you do that, you obtain this expression. You still need to subtract, um, what, uh, you still need to subtract the squared mean from this. The squared mean is uh, one over theta squared. Okay, so the mean is this. We derive that the mean squared is equal to this. Now we take the mean squared, we subtract the squared mean, and we get one minus theta over theta squared. That's the, um, the variance of a geometric random variable. In order to, you know, like get an expression that is in the same, again, order of magnitude, I don't know if that's uh, the right expression, but um, that has the same units as the original variable, we take the square root to compute the standard deviation. And here, what I've plotted is the mean plus minus one standard deviation for a geometric random variable that has parameter theta equals to 0 0.2. Okay, so that you kind of visualize the connection of the mean and the standard deviation uh, with respect to the, um, to the distribution. And here you can see that it has to be the standard deviation, right? It does not make sense to uh, put a square distance here. You need to take the square root. Okay, the Poisson random variable gets even more complicated. We have again a k squared here, then we plug in the PMF of the Poisson random variable there, and now we have to do some work. Basically, we start by canceling out one of the k's here um, against the factorial, and then what we do is we split this into this sum, and then we use the fact that, um, um, yeah, well, we, we use a um, a change of variables, essentially, to obtain uh, this expression. I, I don't want to go into the nitty gritty um, because, you know, it, it, it would get very complicated. I encourage you to try to reproduce the, the computations, uh, but I don't think we're going to gain a lot from going into the change of variable and so on. The point is that you end up with this and we still need to subtract the squared mean. When we subtract the squared mean, we, we get that the Poisson random variable it has a variance equal to lambda. This is very interesting because for this random variable, it turns out that the variance and the mean uh, are both equal to lambda. Usually we compare the mean to the standard deviation, which in this case would be square root of lambda. But, uh, you know, it turns out that that's the case. So the standard deviation actually um, is, is a square root of the mean. This is what a Poisson looks like um, for a parameter lambda equals to 25. I've plotted the mean and also uh, plus minus the standard deviation. Poisson, uh, was the Poisson distribution appears, for example, in, micros in microscopy and other imaging applications where the data that you observe are usually, are often, are often Poisson with a mean that is connected to the underlying um, image that you want to, to obtain. Here we're seeing a catalytic nanoparticle. These are actually individual atoms that you see here. It's pretty cool. Taken from an electron microscope from a collaborator of mine who is in Arizona State University, um, Peter Crossier. I'll, I'll call him out here and, and thank him for this. Uh, you, we have a, a catalytic nanopar platinum nanoparticle that is on some substrate of another um, of another material. And the point is that uh, we're going to be interested in the distribution of these intensities here. So here, I drew too much, too much stuff. Here, we just have vacuum. So if we look at the distribution of the values of the pixels, uh, we're going to see uh, the distribution of our noise. Here, we have a relatively constant um, uh, amplitude because there's like this catalytic nanoparticle where the, the atoms all have relatively similar intensities and there's noise on top. And the whole point of this is that both uh, in, in both 
parts of the image, the noise is Poisson with a parameter that is distributed uh, like the underlying image. In this case, like a constant, because there's a, a background intensity basically in the vacuum. And in this case, like a constant that corresponds to the intensity of, of each of these atoms of this nanoparticle. When we, and okay, and, and again, what's the point? Why am I telling you about this? When people uh, check whether uh, they have Poisson noise, they often plot the mean against the variance and see how they compare. In this case, it has to be the sample mean and the sample variance. So we're going to see exactly that for uh, both parts, for the vacuum uh, in red and the nanoparticle in orange. When we look at it, we see that um, so the, each of these points corresponds to a pixel we see that uh, they, they follow a clear trend around the line y equals to x, where like x is the horizontal axis and y is the vertical axis. In the vertical axis, we have the sample variance, and in the horizontal axis, we have uh, the mean intensities. I said that each of this is a pixel. Uh, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, each of this is um, a value of the sample variance against a value of the sample mean. We have data, um, uh, we have many different frames. So the, um, the, this sample variance and sample mean are computed across frames. Okay, so, sorry about that. Um, you might ask, why don't you see everything on the line? The reason why you don't see everything on the line is that these are sample means and sample variances. So they're never going to be exactly like the mean and exactly like the variance, especially because here we don't have that many frames that we're averaging over. But you can clearly see that the variance and the mean are um, you know are not the same, but like are like the same order of magnitude. Let's say, okay, we have um, it, it's clear the pattern here, where um, where the sample means and variances lie close to this uh, line. When we look at the actual distributions, when we actually look at the actual counts, these are counts because it's an electron microscope. It's the electrons that hit the um, the sensors. Uh, we see that, in fact, the observed, the empirical distributions actually are, are well approximated by a Poisson in both cases. Okay, I just wanted to give you an example where um, you would see, you know, you would use this fact that we just derived that the mean is equal to the variance for a Poisson random variable. Okay, let's go back to doing some math. Now let's consider a uniform random variable. We know that the mean is equal to this. Now we're going to derive the mean square. We just need to integrate u squared um, from 0 to 1. Oh, not from 0 to 1, sorry. We're considering a uniform random variable from a to b. Now the antiderivative of u squared is u cubed divided by 3. So we plug that in. And now we do some math, like this cancels out to be equal to this. And then you have to subtract this squared. You can go through the computations yourself. You end up um, with the following expression for the variance. If you take the square root, you, you obtain the standard deviation. And here I'm showing the mean plus minus the standard deviation for a uniform random variable in 0, 1. What about the exponential random variable? Same thing, we're going to compute the mean square. We plug in the PDF of the exponential random variable, an a squared. And now, uh, just like we did for the mean of the exponential random variable, we apply integration by parts. You choose a part that has an easy antiderivative. The other one you're going to differentiate, and you plug them in. Sorry that I'm not going like really into detail into the computations, but again, I don't think uh, they're super interesting. It's integration by parts. You can review it. That's that's not really the point here. We end up with two over lambda squared. Now we have to subtract. 1 over lambda squared, we end up with a variance that is equal to 1 over lambda, a uh, lambda squared, 1 over lambda squared. So here we have a different situation from the Poisson, right? Because the mean is 1 over lambda, the variance is 1 over lambda squared. So in this case, the mean is equal to the standard deviation. And you can see this here, right? This is the mean. 1 minus the standard deviation takes you exactly to 0, which is kind of cool. Okay, so again, this is uh, plus minus the standard deviation for this exponential with lambda equals to 1. We already considered an exponential model for uh, some call center data, if you remember. Uh, so here I'm showing you a histogram of the data that indeed looks quite exponential. 
In this case, the sample mean is equal to 30.8 and the sample standard deviation is equal to 33.6. So, in fact, they're very close. Uh, again, often you, you want, want a, a quick sanity, sanity check, check whether something, something uh, follows, follows at, at, at least, least approximately the parametric, the parametric model that, that you are uh, that, that you're assuming. assuming it's, it's useful to uh, check, check out the, the sample, sample mean sample, sample standard deviation are they cons the relationship with them uh, sorry, sorry the relationship the between them, them is it is consistent, consistent with the model that, that you're assuming, assuming. and in, in this, this case, case it definitely, definitely is. is okay what about, about the gaussian random variable i want to remind you for the gaussian random variable we saw that the, um, the mean was equal to the mean, mean parameter, parameter, which, which means, means that when, when we looked, looked at the maximum likelihood estimator, um, it, it made a lot of sense because the maximum likelihood estimator was just a sample mean, so you're, exact, you're essentially taking the sample mean and plugging it in to the mean of the random variable, or what the mean should be, which is equal to the parameter, right? So you're saying, oh, the parameter is equal to the mean, so it should be equal to the sample mean. It turns out that the maximum likelihood estimator for the sigma parameter of the Gaussian is the sample variance. Okay. okay. So, so let's, let's see what, what happens, happens here. here. So, so we have, have that the mean is equal to mu, and now we're taking the integral of uh, a squared against the PDF. Okay, that's, that's the mean square. square. We, we plug, plug things in. in. We, we take, take the same change of variables that we took for the mean. mean. We, we expand things out. Things, things get a little bit complicated. complicated. I'm not, not going to go into the details, details but, but we, we will use things, things such as, you know, if you, you have, have like a not um, integral, integral in a, in a, a symmetric interval, interval, it's going to be zero. zero. And, and we're also going to use the fact that we know that it, this integrates to one. We end up with an expression which is equal to sigma squared plus mu squared. So what I want you to realize here is that now when we subtract the mu squared, what is going to happen, we end up with the variance is equal to the square, square of the uh, sigma, uh, sigma parameter. parameter. So, so again, again, the maximum, maximum likelihood of the sigma parameter, the maximum likelihood estimator, is the sample variance. variance. What, what are we doing? We're just saying, oh, you know, this parameter corresponds to the, sample, uh, to the variance. Let's, Let's plug, plug in the sample, sample variance. That's uh, uh, exactly equivalent to maximum likelihood estimation uh, for, for the Gaussian distribution. distribution. And, and the fancy name for that approach where you say, well, let's check out the mean, let's check out the variance, and if there are higher moments, we'll also plug them in. That, that approach, approach where you just take the sample mean and the sample variance and you just plug them in as your estimator uh, to obtain the value of the parameters of a distribution, that's called the method of normal. This is a Gaussian with mean zero and standard deviation one. Um, yeah. Okay, so to, to end, I'm going to tell you about an important um, property of the variance, which is uh, what, uh, what happens, happens to the variance when we scale it by a certain constant and we shift it by a constant. And, and we, we should maybe think about this intuitively before even doing any math. So, so if we're looking at the shift around the mean, and when we shift, you know, like, like think of a whole distribution, we just shift it. The mean definitely shifts, and we saw that the mean just shifts by the same amount as whatever you're shifting the, you know, like if you're shifting the distribution by C2, the mean is going to shift by C2. But, but does, does the variation around the mean change? change? Intuitively, it seems it should not change. change. On the other hand, if we scale something by C1 and we're looking at square deviations, maybe they should scale by C1 squared. But again, let's do some math. Now, and this is quite unusual, we're going to use the, um, the actual definition of the variance, the original one, where we're going to consider the difference between this random variable that we're interested in and its mean, and we're going to square it and take the expected value. We're not going to do mean square minus the square of the mean. For this proof, this is much more convenient. And now what we're going to do is we're going to apply um, linearity of expectation here. So by linearity of expectation, C1 comes out and C2 also comes out because they're constants. And now we see that C2 gets cancelled. And the reason is what I just said, right? Well, you're shifting. So, so if you're, if you're just, just considering, considering uh, the variation of the random variable around its mean and you're shifting everything, the shift doesn't matter. This is why the shift cancels out. And, and now you see that C1 can, can come out, but it's, but it's going, going to be squared. squared. And, and this, this is what I meant by you're scaling and then you consider the square, like, you know, probably the scale is, like, this scaling factor is going to, to be squared. And indeed it is. Okay, this comes out. And what we get here is 
the squared difference, difference between the random variable and its mean that shares the variance. So, so when, when we shift um, a random variable, the variance does not change. When we scale the random variable, the, um, we, uh, the, um, the variance is scaled by the square of the scaling factor. Okay, so, so what have we learned? We, learned? Uh, we, we have, have learned, learned the mathematical definition of the mean square, the variance, and the standard deviation. We have derived the variance of some popular parametric models, and we have learned what the variance of a shifted scale random variable is. Thank you very much.